Hello and welcome to episode 141 of the Thinking LSAT podcast in Vienna, Virginia. I'm Ben Olson and with me in Los Angeles is Nathan Fox. How's it going, Nathan? Awesome, dude. I'm getting over my cold. You sound like you're a little bit stuffy all of a sudden. Is that right? Yeah, I am. Could be allergies. I'm not sure. Oh, God damn it. Um, <laughs> we're going to make a concerted effort not to talk about weather at the top of the show anymore, I think. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> I've been noticing in the show notes that we talk about the fucking weather all the time. It's just, that's just so annoying. Um, have you seen any movies? I know you've had Movie Pass for a while. Yeah, no, I haven't uh, been going to the movie theater that much lately, actually. Yeah. Just, um, yeah, taking care of things. So, but how, how about you? Um, I have seen, uh, well, I saw one very remarkable movie, which was Deadpool 2. I don't know if you saw the first one, Ben. I um, did see the first one. It was very good. I yeah. heard that number two is better. Is that uh, true? People on Twitter were popping off about it's so much better than the first one. Okay. And I was like, come on with the hyperbole. Like, it can't, mm-hmm. it can't be that much, but it can't possibly be that much better. And, um, I don't think it was that much better, but it was at least as good, I would say, as the first at one. At least as good. It was oh, awesome. Good. I mean, I just sat yeah. there with like a gigantic grin across my face for, you know, an hour and a half. So, yeah. Um, I find that movie to be extremely clever and, um, <laughs> don't take the kids to that movie. Okay. <laughs> It's too violent. It's too gross. It has too much sex in it. It just too or sexy talk anyway. It's yeah. uh, it's just it's just way too much. Although kids these days, I mean, I know for sure that my eleven year old niece who loves all the superhero stuff, when she sees like a Deadpool poster or whatever, her eyes just light up. You can tell that she's just. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see it, and I'm sure she probably already is seeing it at her friend's house and stuff. Yeah. Um, the other movie I'm excited about is RBG. You know about this movie? Uh, yeah. So it's a. I well, I guess I don't know a whole lot about it. I mean, it's about R- Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, that's obviously. all you need to know. I mean, a documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, it's got going to be a home run for sure. So I'm going to try to see that this week. I was going to I was going to challenge you to see if you could sneak away and see it this week, and then we could talk about it on the show next week. But yeah, yeah, no, I can I can do that. I know you've got a lot on your plate these days. So what are we uh, talking about on the show this week? All right. Well, we have a PSA about another law school with a guaranteed full ride offer. Yeah. So I guess this is maybe working for Thomas Jefferson, or at least people are hoping it works. Yeah. Um, a shout out to a listener who is taking the June 2018 test and gave Nathan a useful edit for his website. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll get there. Okay. Um, and then we're wondering whether someone should accept, uh, E, whoever that is, accept her 30% discount to USD. Hmm. Short answer, no, but I mean, yeah. we'll, we'll go through the situation and we'll talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess the, are these numbers updated for yep. the Thinking LSAT? Okay. So on Facebook, we have the Thinking LSAT podcast group, which is run by Annalisa, by the way. Thank you so much for putting in your time and continuing to do that. Um, there's now 451 members there. We have 16 people on Patreon. Uh, now it's jumped up to $97 every month. I think that's a $6 increase if I remember from last time. Um, you can always email us at help at thinkinglsat.com. That email goes to both of us. Uh, Nathan often beats me to the punch, but we're both trying to get back to you with that email. And you can always check out our services. I'm at strategyprep.com, uh, and Nathan is at foxlsat.com. We both do live classes and online classes, and one-on-one. Nathan's in LA and San Francisco, of course, and I'm in DC. So yeah, let's jump in. This week um, on the, uh, on the podcast group on Facebook, I never, I never go there hardly, but I, I poke my head in from time to time just to see what people are talking about. And this week somebody had posted a news story, um, about Halo Top getting sued for $5 million because the guy felt tricked. The guy wanted full fat ice cream and he ate Halo Top and he was he he was sad, and so he's suing them for five million dollars. Wow! <laughs> like seriously, what's wrong with that guy? I mean, as much as I hate, or I think I should hate Halo Top, although I don't know, it's just based on your personal yeah uh, venom. But um, 
What? Like, what is wrong with people? <laughs> Who knows? It's just a headline. It's probably some yeah. just like clickbait. But anyway, uh, if you are interested in that story and seeing more about what's going on with the Thinking LSAT uh, community on Facebook, you can just go find that group. And um, you have to request to join because we have to keep out, you know, we only want our type of people. We have, yeah. we have closed borders at the Thinking yeah. LSAT f- Facebook group. But anyway, um, now nah, you can come check that out, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure you'll get admitted to the group. Um, if you're listening to, to this right now, you're our kind of people. Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> I listen to the show. Please let me in. That's the password. Um, yep. Lawyers, dude. You can, sue, you can sue anybody for anything because of lawyers. Yeah. Yep. That's how it works. So there you go. Um all right, should we dive into some content? Sure, yeah. So you want to take this first one? Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is from a patron. Okay. Um, who wants to be referred to as Jane. And Jane, the patron on Patreon, she donated some money. And she wanted to ask this question. So uh, if you go to Patreon, Patreon and become a patron... You might get, it's funny, you might get special treatment and you might get bumped to the top of the show agenda. Um, anyway, here's the questions from Jane. It says, hello, Ben and Nathan. Here's where I am at right now. <clears throat> and I was hoping you can give your commentary on my credentials and goals for law school. Bullet points. My undergraduate degree, clinical science GPA was a 3.1, after which I got a job analyzing cancer genetics for eight years. And she's still there. While working, I enrolled and graduated with a master's degree in forensic science with a GPA of 3.4. While working full-time and getting my grad degree, I managed to get promoted at work and get a teaching position in forensic biology, but now I am finally giving in to my dream of going to law school, giving in to my dream of going to law school. I started studying in February, aiming for the June 2018 exam. I made a study schedule for every day. I practiced at least 12 hours a week. I subscribed to your excellent podcast and bought a few prep books. My diagnostic score was a 142. Immersed in my preparation, my score went up to a 155 with reading comp strongest. But I just realized that I forgot to register for the damn June test. Go figure. Boy, have I heard that a lot of times. Many, 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 many times have I heard people saying they forgot to sign up for the test. Yeah. Um, ideally, I want to apply a JD in the clinical world, so that's healthcare law or patent law. This would re- require me to get accepted locally. Hmm? Uh, Jane is saying that in order to work in these fields, she thinks she has to go to a local law school. Maybe because of her connections in medicine? Yeah. Okay. I would push back on that a little bit. Uh, I would think if you just go to, you know, if you go to a great law school, you can practice anything you want, anywhere you want, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyway, what is the likelihood of getting into Brooklyn Law or Benjamin Cardozo, Cardozo with my science background, zero law exposure, compounded with my GPAs? My target LSAT is 160 plus, Here's hoping to take it in July, if not September. Um, mm, you could, you got it, Jane. I, I know you're a patron, and we appreciate that. But this is the type of thing that you have to look up yourself. If you go look at their ABA 509 reports, you'll be able to say, just look at the LSATs and GPAs. Um, also, if you Google LSAT GPA calculator, you can put in any number you want. So you can put in your current. 155, you could put in your 160 or 162 or whatever you think you're going to reach. And you can hit calculate and it'll show you your odds not only at Brooklyn Law but and, and Benjamin Cardoza, but also at a million other schools. So I don't know, Ben, do you, do you feel like you want to do any other stats starvation other than that? No, I think that's good. I mean, to, to remind her for anyone who doesn't know that. Um, I think the nature of this question suggests a misunderstanding. She says, with my science background and zero law exposure, that's not really a bad thing. The fact that you have science background is good. It makes you unique. Um, When it comes to applications, uh, 
at the end of the day, your GPA and your LSAT score are going to matter the most, not your lack of legal exposure. But when it comes to whether or not you should go, I guess I'm a little concerned. I, I don't understand why you've pursued genetics for so long and had this dream of going to law school. I'm just concerned that it's based in a mythology of law school and the legal profession and you're going to show up there and not be super happy. Now, maybe in your all your work you've done, you've worked with lawyers or something, and you like what they do, and now you know what you want to do, and that's why it's your dream. But uh, I I don't know. This I'm worried that <laughs> this idea is just based on some myth of what the law is or what you'll be doing. Yeah, I hope that she's connected through her research uh, in you know cancer genetics and in her forensic science masters and getting promoted and teaching forensic biology and all that. I mean, I just hope that she has connections. If she has connections that are going to lead to jobs, then okay, good. Um, Go to the best local law school that'll give you a full ride and get your JD because the JD is just not going to be that important compared to all of your like science background for the Mm -hmm. type of work you're, you're wanting to do. Um, It seems like the JD would be necessary, but it's like, you're not going to learn anything in law school that's going to help you actually do that stuff. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I agree with you, Ben. It seems like she has a little misconception like that her science resume is going to matter to her law school admission case. Yeah. It, it, it could help at the margins, but I mean, the truth is you're a 3.1 GPA and you're whatever your LSAT is. And mm-hmm. the 3.4 isn't going to impress, the, the master's degree with a 3.4 isn't going to impress anybody. We've talked about that on a recent show. We sort of expect people to have a 4.0 in their master's degree if they have a master's mm-hmm. degree. Forensic yeah. science sounds like maybe it's harder and maybe a 3.4 is good. Um, I don't know. Anyway, that doesn't go into their index formula. They, they're, they don't report that number to the ABA. It's just not really, that's not a huge part of their analysis, your, your master's grades. So yeah. you're a 3.1 and a, whatever your LSAT is. Um, we say this over and over and over, but you just need to get a strong LSAT score is what is what will really make them start looking at you closely. Mm-hmm. They're going to really be interested when they see a 160 something. Um, yeah, 150 something. They're going to be like, eh, what scientist? Really? 155 science scientist? Really? It doesn't just it doesn't like ring true, you know. Mm-hmm. So you need, even if it is true. So you need you need to just get into the 160s to show them what you're capable of. Yeah. Uh, what's your advice about going to law school part time in order to maintain my clinical job? Sounds great. Yeah. Work through it. law school. Don't pay tuition. Also, keep your day job so that you can pay your rent. Um, <laughs> and you can jump ship at any time if you realize that this is not what you want to do. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, you get bad grades your first year, and you can just immediately drop out and just go right back to work. Yep. Um, what is the likelihood of getting any scholarship money given the current GPA and LSAT of 155 to 160? I, I don't know. I mean, you got to do the LSAT GPA calculator thing, and if it pops up that you're a 75% or higher chance to get in, you know, if it shows you that you're a 90% plus chance to get in, then you would expect to get some money. But you can look even closer into that on the ABA 509. So you just Google ABA 509 um, Brooklyn Law School. Yep. And you'll see what money they're giving. You'll see the LSAT and GPA percentiles, and you'll see the money awards, how many people at the school that they're giving money to. Um, and you'll be able to figure this out for yourself, what the likelihood is. Um, yeah. Would an application addendum be necessary to explain the low GPA? She goes on, i.e. having a full-time job? Yeah, I would definitely ex- try to explain that. I mean, sure. it's not necessary, but it's highly recommended, right? Yeah, I think you could also point to your clinical science major. You know, you could mention that it's hard to take OCHEM when you're working full-time job, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, keep it short. And sweet, and and just point to the fact that you had external factors. But again, if you're doing that with a 155, they're going to roll their eyes a little bit. Yeah, you know, 
if you do that with a 165, they're going to be like, oh shit, yeah, okay, we believe you. Mm -hmm. You definitely have the goods here. You have the horsepower. We're not worried about the horsepower. Well, when you show up with a 155, they're like, well, boy, we have all these other people that have higher LSAT scores, though. So you're going to try to tell us that you're you're smart enough to do it. You just had these other distractions, your full-time job or whatever. But your LSAT score is also not that great. So... You know. So maybe there's another explanation for your low GPA. Yeah, well, they're they're just <laughs> exactly. Eventually, they're going to want to see performance. Ultimately, they care about performance. So LSAT is a good way to perform. Yeah, you know. On that note, she's applying to a part time program. She's going to plan, or yeah, she's planning to continue working. Yeah. Oh, I just I don't perform my best when I have to also work a full time job. Please admit me to your part time law program. Yeah, you might want to focus mm. on the difficulty of the program. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, if if you do exactly. Good point, Ben. Thank you for pointing that out. Um okay. Anything else for Jane? No, that's great. All right. All right, this is a PSA. Hi guys. Quick email. Concordia Law in Idaho is giving me is giving full scholarships to anyone with a one sixty and above. Screenshot of the email that they sent is attached. Okay. I am pleased to announce that Concordia University Law School of Law is offering full tuition scholarships to admitted students with, with an LSAT score of 160 or higher. When it comes to selecting a law school, oh, this is the email from yep, them. From Concordia, yeah. When it comes to selecting a law school, I know you have a number of choices. So why Concordia Law? There's, there are many reasons, but to name a few, 90% July 2017 and February 2018 Idaho bar passage rate. Hmm. Student faculty ratio of 7.6 to 1, and 97% of our students would attend Concordia Law again. <laughs> <laughs> That's so much fun the first time. <laughs> well, that's an interesting stat. I'm excited to share this opportunity and feel that you would be a fantastic addition to the Concordia Law student body. We look forward to receiving your application. Please let me know if you have any questions. All the best, Jeremy. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Thomas continues. Hi, Nathan. I just spoke with them. The only renewal requirement was maintaining good academic standing. They define that as a 2.0 or higher. Yeah, that's pretty good. If you can't keep a 2.0, you shouldn't be in law school. Well, anyway. you're just not even in academic. You wouldn't, they would be kicking you out of law school, I think, if you had yeah. lower than a 2.0. So the reason why I wanted to add this to the agenda is that I would, I actually want help from the listeners here. Um, I really, really appreciate this email. Um, who, Thomas, thank you, Thomas, for sending this in. And thank you for following up with them about the renewal requirements when I asked you to do that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we now have two schools. We have Thomas Jefferson in San Diego and we have Concordia Law in Idaho. And they're making it very explicit that they will charge you zero tuition if you get a certain LSAT score. At Thomas Jefferson, the number's a little bit lower, I think. And they have a matrix. They have like a, you know, if you get a 159 or higher, it doesn't matter what your GPA is. If you get like a 154 or higher, but you also have a 3.5 or higher, um, well, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but that's all published on their website, and we've talked about that before. So you can go to Thomas mm-hmm. Jefferson's website if you want to look at that matrix. But Concordia is is giving a slightly different offer here. It's just, hey, get a 160, you get a full ride. Simple as yeah. that. Okay. So I now I I just want I want <laughs> doubling down on don't pay for law school. You do not have to pay for law school. There's a school in San Diego. There's a school here somewhere in Idaho. I don't know where. But there are other schools. There have to be other schools, right? So Mm -hmm. I'm putting the call out to the Thinking LSAT uh, community to please email us, help at thinkinglsat.com. When you hear these deals, if if you know other schools that have similar deals, please send us a note so that we can, I want to build up a list of all of these schools. And I'm not saying you should go to Thomas Jefferson. I'm not saying you should go to Concordia. Um, I'm saying I would rather you go to Thomas Jefferson or Concordia than pay for whatever law school you're thinking about paying for. Yeah, exactly. So we start with a default of, well, if I don't get any better offers, I'm just going to get a 160 and go to Concordia, or I'm going to get a 159 and go to Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. And then, if, and then you can apply to other schools and you can see what kinds of deals those other schools get, give you. But if you're not getting a full ride, why would you be, you don't, it's an option to pay for law school. 
Would you like to be a practicing attorney without paying? <laughs> yeah. Then go to one of these schools and be, be clear about what you're paying for when you're paying for a JD. By the way, this is a side note, but I think it reflects well on Concordia. This law, this email, I think is excellent. I was going it's, to compliment it as well. I, I liked it as well. Yes. To the point, but it's also got some substance and I don't know, use the short sentences and long sentences, even get a semicolon in there. I like the semicolon. Yeah. Good job, Jeremy. Should we shout out his last name? We have his last name. Yeah. Is that Goto? Yeah. Goto? Sure. Jeremy Goto at Concordia Law. Doing a good job for his uh, team there. He should get promoted. He should. I wonder if this was his idea. The the program? Maybe he's a listener. (laughs) (laughs) It's well done. All right, we cool. are going to bust up the game, right? We're 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 busting up the game with the uh, with the the wild do not pay for law school um, assumption. There's there's going to be some competitors that are going to pop up that are going to start offering deals like this. Yeah, and well, those two schools are getting outsized attention, I think, because of what they're doing. They're, they're doing getting a lot of love on the Thinking Else that podcast. That's for sure. Yeah. They haven't paid us a dime and they're getting, they're getting shout outs all the time. They're going to continue to get shout outs too, but hopefully yeah. we'll hear some, we'll get some other schools in the mix. You know, maybe we'll have a portfolio of 15 or 20 schools across the country that are offering these kinds of deals and we can just start sending people to these schools instead of letting them get ripped off, um, by these mediocre, you know, Ooh, tier one or tier two or top, whatever law sure. schools. Yeah. I saw on Twitter the other day, I almost sent it to you. I saw a, a, like an advertisement for University of Washington School of Law. Okay. A top 20 law school. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> top 20. You <laughs> know what that guess. means? What are you? 20. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that means they're ranked 18th, 19th, or 20th. <laughs> you say. know, at least they had the respect to, you know, say top 20. It's funny when they're like. <laughs> When they go so far as to say, a school in the top 24. <laughs> yeah, if they had said top 19, then I would have known, I would have known their ranking. <laughs> That's a t- that would be a tell. Yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks, Thomas, for sending that in. And please, listeners, please, um, if you hear of other uh, guaranteed. So now, these are, these are good, too, right? Both of these are, um, they don't take it away from you. As long as you just keep going to school and passing your classes, um, they don't take that scholarship away. And it's a guaranteed full tuition scholarship with just a certain LSAT score. Yeah. Um, let's let's hear more of these offers. Let's get let's build a good foundation for people so that they have options so that they can go to law school for free. Amen. Yeah. Um, is this me? It is. Hi, Nathan. I love the podcast and have been a listener for a few months. The podcast has helped a lot of people by answering their questions on what to do with law school offers, and I'm hoping you can help me as well. A little background. I applied late because I went with my February LSAT score. Mm. Wah, wah. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bad start. Um, you do not want to be applying in the spring to go to law school that same year. That's a bad, bad, bad plan. You want to be applying early. Oh, side note here. Yes. If any if any school contacts you and says, no problem, we'll accept your June LSAT or your <laughs> L, your July LSAT for this cycle to apply to, to start going to law school a few months later, run away. Yeah, it's because they're they're just trying to rip you off. They're they're seeing if you don't care about money. They're seeing if you're so desperate to dive into law school immediately that you're willing to throw in a very late application and just, it's, yeah, they're, they're just looking to cherry pick naive people who are willing to pay full price for law school. That's all yep. they want to see. You know, there's like, oh, hell, here's a lazy person. <laughs> also keep in mind, if they're doing that, that's because they have open seats that they yeah, need to fill. True, true. Yeah. Although open seats, you know, it's open seats is sort of, it's a kind of a, it's kind of relative, right? I mean, if you think about what they do at like ballparks and stuff where they, they will close off sections and like call it a sellout. Mm. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not, I don't think, especially these days, because we've had a bit of a retraction, right? In the size of law school classes, they've, they've shrunk by 25% at many schools and 
And so they still, I mean, it's not like the facilities are smaller. And yeah. it's not like it's hard to put one more person in the back row. Mm-hmm. So I think what they do is they just, you know, they, they get a mix of people early on. They, they try to, they give scholarships to the people who are, you know, the best candidates and who are going to perform probably the best at that school. Mm-hmm. Those are the people that they're really interested in. And as far as building a reputation for the school, then they need people to pay the bills. And so yeah. they just, from, from that point forward in the cycle, I have a feeling they're just sort of, well, if you've got numbers that get you in the conversation, we're basically going to admit you and see if you'll pay full price. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. I mean, they're in, in May or whatever, when they're looking, oh yeah, you can apply with your February LSAT score. Sure. Yeah. You can start this fall. Um, mm-hmm. uh, of course they're going to be, you know, you're going to have to have some numbers that get you they don't want to have, you're not going to get in with embarrassingly low numbers, but you can still probably get in with numbers that are like at or slightly below the middle of the class. Mm-hmm. If you're willing to pay full price. Yeah. You know, especially if you consider that like at many of these schools, 80% of the class is getting some sort of a discount. Yeah. And now you're not going to get a discount or you're going to get a very shitty discount. Yeah. Come on in. Sure. Plenty of room. Just sign right here. <laughs> You're, they're basically giving up their potential ranking score with your lower numbers for your money. They're saying, pay us and we will bite the bullet to accept you and use you to keep the lights on. Yeah, and despite all of the bullshit they're going to tell you when they admit you of you know how it's such an honor and you're going to be a great member of the whatever, you know, you're going to be a very strong candidate. Yeah. The truth is, if they're not giving you a scholarship, they... They know you're not going to do well. I mean, they, they uh, sorry, statistically speaking, on average, <laughs> I'm not, 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 this is not, not going to necessarily apply to every special snowflake, but mm-hmm. on average, the snowman is going to melt. Yeah. How about that? Interesting analogy. Yeah. But you will melt in law school and be stuck with that. Yeah, you're going to pay full price. If you're paying full price, other people there probably are better equipped to compete for grades. And you're going to have to compete with those people for grades. So, yep. anyhow, back to this email. Um, I applied late because I went with my February LSAT score. This is contrary to all of our advice. My LSAT score on record is a 153. Super low, I know. 3.7 GPA from UC Irvine political science. I got waitlisted at both USD, that's University of San Diego, and UCI, that's UC Irvine, Orange County. So I decided I'm going to reapply with a new LSAT score. I'm signed up for June. And then it's an update here. Current situation, I am off the waitlist from USD, and they are offering $17,000 a year. That's a lot of money, Ben. Oh, wow. What could I do with that money? Oh. What could I do with that discount? The tuition is $54,000. <laughs> so let's see. So that is a, what, less than one-third discount? Yep. 30% roughly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was told more scholarship opportunities will be available to me after my first year if I have good standing as a student. Oh dear. That is, that is, a, sounds like a bait and switch. Come, you can get even more money. Yeah. More scholarship opportunities. That's just a fucking lie is what that is. I mean, well, it's, it's technically true. Like if you finish number one in your class and you or top 10% and you, they know that you could easily transfer to a better school. Yeah. Then they'll give you money to keep you. That happens all the time. But if you're with, with your 153 LSAT, I don't have any reason to suspect that you're going to kick ass at USD. Mm -hmm. So yeah, boy. Oh yeah. No, just come, come, come. Pay us uh, thirty, whatever, thirty-seven thousand dollars for your first year. <laughs> thirty-seven thousand dollars, Ben, is what she would have to pay. That's after her seventeen thousand dollar discount. Yeah, thirty-seven thousand dollars would be her first year tuition, and then more scholarship opportunities will be available if you have good standing. Yeah, right. Like, 
they're not going to just up your offer if you do like okay. Yeah. Hey, I'm I'm staying in the class. I'm why like, would they? Standing. Why would they ever give you more money if you do okay? If you absolutely kill it and they know that you might leave, then they would give you more money, and that's the only time they would give you more money. Yep. Um, she well, wait, continued. No, out of the goodness of their heart, right? <laughs> yeah, they're so generous. Yeah. Um, I uh, sorry. I did not think I would waver because I want to get a full ride, but the thought of taking another year depresses me, so I am considering the offer. Here, hold on. Don't let that depression get to you. Just imagine yourself like three years from now and you have a monthly student loan payment of... I don't know. It depends on how much money you end up taking out, but some people it's pretty high. So let's say it's eight hundred dollars a month, and eight hundred dollars a month. Does it, that sounds that sounds very conservative? Yeah, I'm, I, I was going to say cons- two thousand a month. Yeah, I know. I just you have a range of. I guess it depends on. How well, eight hundred dollars a month. She's an income based repayment at that point. <laughs> so okay, yeah, you're only so, yeah okay. Let's say two thousand. <laughs> that's I mean whatever. It's all. It's just a thought experiment. So just imagine yourself paying two grand, and also imagine that the three law firms that you were hopeful to start working at have gotten back to you and said that they decided to go with another candidate. <laughs> so you're looking at student loans. You're not looking at a a typical legal job, so you decide to go bridge the gap for a little bit by becoming um, a waitress or something like that, and um, see how you feel then. Is that is that depressing? <laughs> yeah, or you're studying for the bar the second time. Ooh. I yeah. mean, California bar passage rates just came out and they're really, really devastatingly low, like unbelievably low, like 30%. What? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Something like that. It's, it's outrageous. It's, they I bounce. thought low would be like 60. No, they bounce around. I mean, California is the hardest bar in the country. So now she's saying, you know, she, she goes on saying she wants to, she she wants to practice trial law in San Diego. Um, well, you know, in order to do that, you have to pass the California bar. And right now, you have a 153 LSAT, which, you know, your 3.7 GPA from UCI, that's not nothing. I mean, it's poli sci. It's not like that's a hard major, but you, still, 3.7 is good grades. So I believe in you as a student. Like, I know you can apply yourself. But with a 153, people with 153s have a hard time with the bar sometimes. Yeah. And so, right. So, if you're if you're depressed about waiting another year, think about what it would be like to have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt, no job, and you haven't passed the bar yet. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel then? Do you feel the pressure at all? Hopefully, that should motivate you. Like you counter the negative with a negative. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Fighting fire with fire. Yeah. Fight depression with even more depression. <laughs> yep. Uh okay. So um yeah. I was told there's a small chance I can be offered more money if I improve my LSAT score. I think she's referring to this cycle, like if she takes it in June yeah. and goes this year and they they might be able to bump up the offer. But the thing is they guarantee I guarantee they will bump up the offer next year. Mm-hmm. Not only that, but speaking of San Diego, you could get a full ride to Thomas Jefferson. You, right now, you could get a full ride to Thomas Jefferson. Wait, good, Thomas Jefferson is a full ride? I thought it was 159. You're saying uh, it's No, but she has good grades because they have that whole matrix. Oh, She yeah. has a 3.7. Mm-hmm. With, a one point, with a 153 and a 3.7, that might already be a full ride to Thomas Jefferson. And if not, it's damn close. Yeah. You can go for free and chill out because if nothing works out, then all you've paid for is your cost of living. There is no way in hell USD is worth $34,000, sorry, $37,000 a year more than Thomas Jefferson. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson, $0. 
University of San Diego, $37,000 a year. That there's I'm literally not, <laughs> unless you have unlimited money. I think the problem here is that sometimes these numbers get so big that people emotionally check out from them, right? What's yeah, the difference between $24,000 and $37,000? But imagine this for a second. If you're in the grocery store and you ever catch yourself debating between, you know, off-brand graham crackers <laughs> and regular graham crackers, you're you're like you're oscillating over 20 cents or something like that. Right. So if you have the the wherewithal to debate and take your time to think about whether you should buy off-brand or regular graham crackers, then yeah. you need to think about $37,000, which 20 would, 20 million cents. Yeah, is what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you you could you could gleefully buy the the brand name graham crackers for the rest of your life and still not make any difference in yeah a million times. <laughs> yeah, this is a million times more important than that thing you're agonizing over in the grocery store. Literally, a million mm-hmm. times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right about the scale. The magnitude of it makes people just totally lose their perspective. You know that thing I told you about the 52 factorial, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was telling my friend about it the other night, and she pushed back on me. She goes, but what if all the people on the face of the earth were doing this at the same time? Mm. And I was like, well, remember how you were supposed to wait one billion years between steps as you were yeah. walking around the earth? Yeah. Okay, so don't do that. Just wait one year instead. Yep. <laughs> Solved. <laughs> There's a billion people doing it now. Yeah. You wait one year. You wait one year per step, but you're still you're walking around the earth and you're still emptying out the Pacific Ocean one drop at a time. And you're still oh building gosh. a stack of paper that goes to the sun. And oh, and then when you get to the sun, instead of being one thousandth of the way there, you are one hundredth of the way there. And now that's ten billion people doing it at the same time. Mm. Which is more than all the people on the earth. So yeah. it's like, that's exactly what's going on here. You're right. Yeah. That's, that is good perspective. I think the numbers are so big that people just don't even realize that it's just, it's astronomical. You should not be paying this money. This is a terrible, terrible deal. To be honest, this is an awful, awful deal. $17,000 mm-hmm. off of $54,000 is an awful deal. Yeah. It's a no brainer. There's no, there's no, no chance that this is a good idea. Um, the problem is that I have to give my answer to USD by this Monday, and I still don't know about UCI because she's waitlisted at UCI. I really want to go to UCI because I had a good experience during my undergraduate. <laughs> that's t- that's a pretty terrible reason to pick a law school. Yeah. Um, also, if you get in off the waitlist, you're going to have to pay full price. <sighs> I want to go to trial law into trial law and practice in San Diego. I would appreciate any feedback. I know what you will recommend, which is taking another year and reapplying, but I want to really emphasize the fact that I do not want to take another year. I want to know what your opinion is on USD's offer. They are saying that all they can offer is $17,000. Should I ask for more, even though I was on their wait list, applied late, and have a shitty LSAT score? Thanks in advance. Sincerely, E. Thoughts? Beyond what we've already said? Mm, not really. You just need to let go of um, this money, or this supposed money, this scholarship, and the time. That's really what it is, I guess. You have to think to yourself, are you worth, uh, how much is this going to cost her? $150,000? Yep. So are you worth $150,000 a year right now? Are you ever going to be worth $150,000 a year? That's a <laughs> lot of money. Most people don't make that much money. Yeah. Even big time law firm lawyers, which I don't know if that's what you want to do or not, but I mean, you're not going to do that coming from USD anyway. So why, I don't know why, what's, what's so, what's so special about this year? I mean, go back to, I'm, I'm looking right now at the ABA 509. Yeah. For, for, for USD. What percentage, Ben, would you think, what percentage of their school do you think is receiving some grants? I would say at least half. It's probably like 75%. 76% of the school is getting some sort of a discount. So 
Oh, you're looking at the 509 right now? I'm looking at the 509. And, wow. You know, so, E, you're not special that you're getting a grant. Almost everybody there gets a grant, or three quarters of the class gets a grant. So they gave you some money. 39% of the class, half, almost half of the class, 40% of the class, gets half to full tuition. And 1% of the class gets more than full tuition. The... You know, the 25th percentile grant amount is 16000 So she's right at the, the 25th percentile grant amount. She's getting one of the smallest grants they give. Mm-hmm. 50th percentile is 28000 75th percentile is 41000 And if, if she just waits another year, by the way, another year at this point is only waiting like four months. If she applies in September with mm-hmm. a better LSAT score, they're going to double her offer like in like nothing. I mean, that's a, that's a, a just a total no brainer. Look at their LSAT. <sighs> she has already over their 75th percentile undergrad GPA 3.7. Their 75th percentile is 3.67. Yeah. Her LSAT of 153 is below their 25th percentile. Yeah. If she worked harder, retook the LSAT and improved by a mundane, you know, if she improves by seven points, Mm -hmm. she will be at their 75th percentile, which is a 160. And if she rolls in there in September with a 160 and a 3.7, they're going to offer her close to a full ride. They're going to offer her that 75th percentile grant amount, at least. They're going to offer her $41,000 instead of $17,000. Yeah. So um, that's an increase of $24,000 times three. Yep. So that's $75,000 that you could get by waiting four months. So if we offered you $75,000 to wait to go to law school a year from now, to matriculate a year from now, would you say uh, no? This they these and and e we're not I'm not trying to pick on you or anything. It's just like you you knew what you were going to get when you wrote in and asked this email. You knew you were going to get a scolding. So I mean, you're getting a scolding. Sorry, <laughs> but like, <laughs> I my opinion is of this offer is that this offer is garbage. You are looking at a garbage offer, and you're about to sell yourself ridiculously short because you're. Because you're in such a goddamn hurry to to, to do what? I, I don't I don't get it. I really don't. I don't understand. You know, a good analogy here would be uh, paying for airplane tickets, right? You know, if you wait until the last second, you have to pay a lot more. So, in essence, that's what you're doing. You're saying, "Oh, I really want to go on this trip now, so I'm gonna pay more because I didn't um, buy my tickets early enough." Uh, how often do you do that? Are you willing to pay twice as much for your plane ticket to go wherever you want to go so you can go next week instead of two months from now? My guess is that you never consider that. And yet that's exactly what you're considering here. You're saying, I want to go now, so I'm going to pay more than twice as much as what I have to pay so that I can have the luxury of going early. Yeah. It's lazy too because like she doesn't want to do the LSAT part of it. I, th- yeah. I think that's part of it. Is that she's intimidated by the LSAT? Seems like she knows she can do better. Her undergraduate grades certainly indicate that she can do better. Yeah, but you know, it's going to take some work. It's it's not maybe it's not going to be super super fun. But we see people improve from one fifty three to one sixty all the time, and that's going to be worth seventy five thousand dollars to you in a heartbeat. It's going to be worth seventy five thousand. You need to withdraw all of your offers, E. Um, please take yourself off the wait list at Irvine. If you get in off the wait list at Irvine and decide to go there and pay full price, that's going to be a gigantic mistake as well. That's going to mm-hmm. be a quarter of a million dollar mistake. So just withdraw all of your candidacies. Retake the LSAT in June slash July slash September. Reapply next time. When you apply this fall, apply broadly. Apply to more schools. Please consider applying to Thomas Jefferson, which will charge you zero dollars tuition. 
you could at least maybe use that to negotiate and get a full ride out of USD. Yeah. With a 160, you deserve a full ride to USD. I don't know why she's hung up on Irvine either, man. If she wants to practice in San Diego, she should just go to one of these San Diego law schools for free. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Lecture over? Done. (laughs) All right. Take the next one. Good evening, fellas. Sad to hear about the NYC class. We were planning to do a class in New York and weren't able to make it happen. We're still working on it. We're still thinking about it. Yep. We're trying. We'll come to New York and do a weekend, uh, something like that. Me and Ben teach a class together. You yep. can send us a note if you're interested in that. And uh, we'll hope, hopefully, maybe, maybe some chance, Ben, to put it together this summer. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a good chance. Before the July test? Yeah, I okay. think so. If not, before September? Yeah, but we should shoot for July. Yeah, let's do it. James says, looking forward to an update. Well, there's our partial update. <laughs> The odds have increased. I would like to thank you both for your wisdom. Wisdom? Wow. I have been struggling to break the 170 mark despite a 161 cold diagnostic in March. Today I meditated for a few minutes, recited a few affirmations, cooked breakfast, went uh, for a run, and took a cold shower. (laughs) Okay. Read Hal... Read. Oh, I thought he was just saying that he had read this and that nah. that was, yeah. Okay. Suggestion from James. Read yes. Hal Elrod's The Miracle Morning. Yeah. Okay. Um, that reminds this me This is of some Tony I, Robbins shit right here, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I've never heard of this guy. That no, stuff really turns me off, honestly. Which the is cold shower? Too. The cold plunge? No, no. Actually, not the cold shower. Yeah, the cold shower turns me off. Uh, at the Just Tony Robbins and that whole, like, I don't know. Personal empowerment? Yeah. We, I've read a lot of books, but I, I tend to steer c- clear of people who are like, I don't know, experts at everything and nothing. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. in any case, I don't, I'm don't. i not saying this advice is bad. The person uh, could have good advice by accident too. But um, this, is, did, it's very, this is very lawyer-like. I have to say, I mean, the fact that he's doing all of this shit in the morning on his way to work yeah. is, is very, very lawyerly. I've been reading this book, um, 24 Hours with 24 Lawyers, you know, okay. part of my mm-hmm. research for this sure. other book I'm trying to write. Yeah. And um, I, so far, I'm like 10 of these profiles in, and I don't think a single one of them has gotten more than six or five or six hours of sleep. And they're all getting up at 6 a.m. And they're all just nonstop busting their ass until midnight. Mm-hmm. Just 100% of them, but all the yeah. way all, across the board. So, you know, hey, yeah, you're That's the type of person. Why? Well, I just, I, I would just hope that given the number of lawyers out there, they would find a few who had figured out how to like take it easy and still be successful at what they do. I don't think there's any chill in, in lawyers in real lawyers. I think they just, they, they, they have an unbelievable desire to work. They just want to work. Law is inherently competitive and they just, you want to kill your competitor. Yeah. And you just love the struggle. So if you're the type of person who's going to get up immediately meditate recite a few affirmations, cook yourself breakfast, go for a run, and then take a cold shower and do all of that before taking your train to Midtown Manhattan to work or to wait, oh, to go do a practice test. <laughs> <laughs> and then work. <laughs> if, if that's you, you know, then you might be a lawyer. Yeah. If all that sounds horrible, you might be me, <laughs> which is not a lawyer at all. Which is why we're... Talking about this. You might be a podcaster. And mocking it. <laughs> if you like getting up late, making yourself a cup of coffee, and recording a podcast in your pajamas, then you might be <laughs> you might be a podcaster. <laughs> so right. I did read that book. I don't know if you remember this. It was called um, What Doesn't Kill Us. Yeah. yeah. And it was I remember you talking about it. Oh, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Although I stopped doing that. Um, it sounds miserable. Um, it's actually not. Despite the fact I stopped doing it, uh, I like being cold. Well, it wakes you up. It's kind of like those. It's like working out. You know, some like, you don't want to do it necessarily, but when you're done, you're once glad you, you do it, it, you're like glad you did. Yeah, 
If I would have to pay Tony Robbins to come actually drag me out of bed and throw me into the cold shower. That's awkward. <laughs> I would do it. <laughs> Whatever, dude. It's one of those things. It doesn't sound that great, but once Tony Robbins grabs you with his gigantic hands and throws you into the sh- cold shower, you're happy he did it. For some reason, <laughs> sorry, that comment just reminded me. Remember, we got an email from Trump's campaign this week. What? what was up with that? You didn't see that? No. Help at thinkinglsat.com got an email from Trump's campaign saying, oh, oh there's, I don't know what it was. It was about um, investigating Obama's something i was like seriously we're still talking about obama <laughs> but i thought someone might have signed us up might have signed up to help with thinking as a joke it. yeah as a joke so thank you whoever yeah. did that we we're so glad to receive trump's um emails to his cronies his fans wow so anyways uh james continues i hopped onto the tr- on the train to midtown manhattan to sit for my fifth test master's practice test this must be like saturday morning yeah, I think so. My most I thought recent... it was work, but no, it's, yeah. it's Saturday morning. Okay. Uh, my most recent score was a 167, and my highest, a 169. As I sat for my test, I told myself over and over, I will take my time, I will correctly answer each question that I get to. Yeah, it's good to say that, but don't say it while you're reading a question. <laughs> <laughs> I would tweak it a little bit, too. I, I don't even like the that I get to part of that. I would just say, I will take my time, I will correctly answer this question. Sure, sure. You know? And then he's when you're the done spirit, with that one, right? you can move on. Yes, he does. He's got I, that I get to, that I, I is suggesting that I won't yes. get to all of them. Yeah. Yes. Previously, I thought I could get away with pacing myself and answering every question as I had done so and scored minus ones on the LR sections. I thought I was special, an exception to the rule. Today I learned I am not special. I am not an exception to the rule. I answered 23 out of 25 on the first LR got minus two. The two unanswered questions. That means he aced the first 23 questions that he ate. Sweet. Got to. Um, I answered 23 out of 23 on the logic games, got minus two. They were stupid mistakes. Need to be more diligent and organized. Hmm. Okay. Um... I wonder what he means by stupid mistakes. Sometimes when people say that, I get nervous. I'm like, mm. no, there might have actually been something that you should not have done that's substantive. Maybe you didn't mm. prep enough, but okay. Um, we'll take your word for it since we don't know anything else. I answered 26 out of 27 on reading comp, got minus two. Best school, Best RC score by far. Pretending the material is interesting helps. <laughs> Good. It actually is interesting when you, if you actually read it, it actually is interesting. Yeah. Most of these are detailed topics about something that you probably sh- should find interesting at the very least. I answered 25 out of 26 on LR. <laughs> Hat two, okay, the second LR section. I got minus zero. On the last question, I had time to eliminate two answer choices quickly before making an educated guess. Sweet. Raw score, 95 out of 101. Scaled score, 174. Thank you both for the work you put into the podcast. When I'm not budgeting every dime, I'll be sure to donate some of the money you will have saved me on law school. Well, that's a lot. So I'm glad yeah. you said some of the money. Just because... give us a quarter of it. <laughs> yeah. That's fair. We'll be happy. Any tips on consistently scoring in the 170s now that I'm sure that I have the potential? Keep doing what you're doing. Your score is going to go up and down. And by the way, logical flaw up here. He says he thought that he was special, and then he said, oh, I know I'm not special because of this one example. <laughs> I mean... It's fine that he's drawing the right conclusion, but it's for the wrong reasons. Too many people draw conclusions about what they should be doing and how they should be doing it based on one practice test. Yeah. It's just not smart because you really need to look at your practice test overall as a whole. Yeah. 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 This is a very nice data point, though. I mean, to point out again, I think the purpose of James' email, and thank you, James, for writing in, the purpose is he wanted to 
brag a little bit about how he didn't <laughs> answer. <clears throat> four, he left four questions unanswered. Yep. On purpose. He left mm-hmm. four questions unanswered. And he got almost everything right that he attempted, and he scored a 174. That's without finishing the sections. James is saying you can finish one, you can score a 174. Not only that, but it's actually the highest he's ever scored. And he did that by not answering all of the questions. Previously, he was answering all the questions and scoring lower. And on this test, he did less questions, less work, but he got it all right, and he scored higher. So, but Nathan, yeah. people can't score very well without finishing. Yeah, um, this is in the 99th percentile. You know, and it, I mean, the only way to score higher than this is to just never miss any questions, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, the I, I would, you know, James, any tips on how to can keep doing this? Yeah, keep doing exactly what you're doing. And the the ones you missed, I mean, you didn't miss any on LR, which is awesome. Of the ones you attempted, you got them all right on LR. That's amazing, which is totally possible. Mm-hmm. Ben, you've talked about that before, that you can just not miss any on LR. Mm-hmm. Um, the couple that he missed on games and the one that he missed on RC, those questions have a lot to teach him. Yeah. And that's where he should spend some time, right? So instead of just hammering out another practice test, he should look really closely at those mistakes. He can go ahead and finish up the, the what, there's three Four questions that he didn't attempt. Yeah. He could do those for fun, make sure he gets them right. But then, yeah, just repeat that same process. That's that's what kicking ass looks like right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That it? That's it. Well done, James. Hey, Nathan and Ben. First off, thanks so much for your podcast. I listen to it almost every morning and night. I started studying for the LSAT at the beginning of May, and I'm registered to take the June 11th exam. I'm taking a course at my alma mater and have taken several practice tests. I must say, I find myself reading the passages and questions and answers in the tone of your voices, and even laugh to myself thinking of how you guys would laugh at some of the ridiculous, incorrect answer choices. So thank you both for being (laughs) good. Yeah. So thank you both for being so personal and making studying for the LSAT bearable. Um, you are welcome. Sorry about hearing my voice in your head. That's I'm, I apologize. But <laughs> if it's making you get the questions right, then good. Second, Nate, I noticed on your website in the resources section, it says free June 2017 exam, but really it's the June 2007 exam. Would love a shout out on your next podcast. Thanks again, Kara. Thank you, Kara. I fixed that typo immediately. People always apologize to me when they send in stuff like that. They're always like, hey, don't want to be a dick or anything, but, and they send me something that's like broken on my website or a typo in one of my books. Yeah. I'm always very appreciative of that stuff. Oh, I want to know about those things. Please send me those things. I will fix them. Yeah. No, that's true too. In my score tracker, a lot of times, I mean, there's, I just looked, it was just yesterday actually, there are 7,000 and like 80 or something videos in my YouTube channel, which are then like organized Damn. Yeah, in the score tracker. And so when people write in, they're like, this video is associated with the wrong LSAT question. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> we will fix that. <laughs> there's just, there has to be more mistakes in there too. I, there's just too many things and stuff going on. I mean, I don't think there's that many, but it's very, very helpful when people find them and tell us. So Absolutely. Yeah. We're, yeah. I mean, we're in business and we, we're not going to be personally offended. We're going to be very happy to, to fix that stuff. I mean, of course there's times where I get that and I go, Oh fuck. <laughs> it's embarrassing, you yeah. know, slash I now have to do work. Yeah. But I mean, when I say I have to do work, I basically forward it on to other people and they fix it for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I pay them. <laughs> so anyway, yes, please. So, so, actually, that's not true. On that website edit, I made it myself. I, I did it myself. Wow. Congratulations. I know. I, know. I'm so, I have such work ethic. It's amazing. <laughs> um, so anyways, yes, Kara, you get a shout out. She requested a shout out and she gets a shout out because she pointed out an 
error on my website that I was able to then fix. So thanks, Kara. Yeah. yeah. All right, next one. Hi, guys. I took the September LSAT and scored a 174. Boom. Wow. Okay. I started at Columbia Law in the fall, and I'm interested in tutoring during the summer as much as possible and three to five hours a week during the school year. I know you both have a lot of knowledge of the LSAT test prep industry, and I was hoping to get your opinion on what my best bet is. Should I take the private route or go for working for a company? If so, any suggestions? From what I see, Manhattan Prep pays the most but has a non-compete clause. Any info would be very helpful. I took your advice and gave up my seat at Harvard for the full ride at Columbia, and I'm now yes. looking to minimize my cost of living debt, almost 100000 k as best I can. Thanks. Best, Tanae. All right. Um, hmm. Private route or working for a company? I... I think there's a a lot of advantages to working for a company if you're going to be in law school. You can just depend on them to send you the work and you can get the work done um, and then focus on what you should really be focusing on. But it kind of depends on your personality and how much you feel comfortable drumming up business. Yeah, if you're going to do it long term, it's a no-brainer to work for yourself. But working for one of these companies is a good way to get just get started. They'll give mm-hmm. you, they'll give you, you know, that's the great thing about just go to work for Manhattan is that they'll then fill a class for you and put you in the classroom. I mean, downside is, which happened to me when I was a power score teacher, they'll schedule the class, post it. You've got it on your calendar. You're teaching the class. You're going to get paid. It's awesome. You're going to get paid. And then at the very last minute, they cancel the class because of low enrollment, and you end up getting paid zero. Yeah, and all those days were blocked off on your calendar and all that. So you might want to ask them if you're if you're shopping around for an employer when you're interviewing when you're interviewing them mm-hmm. um, for your potential employment with them. If you're going to ask them questions about whether they're a good, good fit for you, one of those would be, "Hey, how often do you cancel your classes at the last minute?" Am I going to have to block off all this time on my calendar and then end up not actually working? Or, hey, will you pay me if that happens? Yeah. They really should. They should pay the instructors for that. Pay them something. Being on call, basically. Yeah, totally. Did you know, I knew jack shit about teaching the LSAT when I started. (laughs) (laughs) I was kind of, I'm kind of glad it wasn't my shingle, you know? I was like working under the power score banner, Mm -hmm. which meant I had to use their materials, which were okay. Good in some cases and okay in other cases, um, but you know, I I just got to go in and just teach the lessons they told me to teach, and didn't have to worry about organizing a classroom space, didn't have to worry about billing, didn't have to worry about a website, business phone number, <laughs> mm-hmm. so many little little frustrations that we have to overcome having our own business. Yeah. But if you can overcome all those little frustrations, then you end up with the greatest gig in the world. So, yeah. I don't know. It sounds like Tanae is going to be like an actual lawyer, though. I mean, if she's doing this just part time, temporary mm-hmm. part time, mm-hmm. yeah, a lot to be said for just go to work for whoever the, the best one is in your area. Yeah. I'm loving that decision to turn down Harvard. Yeah. Baller, baller move. For yeah. the rest of your life, you get to say you turn down Harvard. <laughs> That's amazing. When you talk to other lawyers, oh, they went to Harvard. Yeah, I got into Harvard. What? You got into Harvard? Yeah, I turned them down. Yeah. Well, I mean, Columbia, it's a great school. You heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's in Manhattan. Um, they gave me a full ride. Zero to, I paid zero tuition. Oh, yeah, I was going to pay. $200,000 to go to Harvard. So instead I paid zero and went to Columbia. Yep. Did, did you pay? <laughs> yeah, I paid full ride at Harvard. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. How was that? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it works out fine for those people who do that at yeah. Harvard. Yeah. M- most of them. I mean, there's pro- I mean, there have to be people, though, who went to Harvard, don't practice law, are just saddled with this insane amount of debt. Yeah. Anyway, mm. good job today. Yeah. 
Um, any other advice for that? No? No. Okay. Hi, y'all. Please don't use my real name if this ends up on the podcast. I'm a dedicated listener who has signed up for the July test, and I appreciate you both for creating a free and accessible resource. You know, what you could do is appreciate us on Patreon by donating $1 a month, or $5 a month, or 10 we would really appreciate that. We would really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to see if you guys had any thoughts to share about a career in legal academia. From my preliminary research, I've learned that the typical path for legal academics at one point was getting a JD, working in big law and or clerking, and eventually working as a professor. That is the typical path. However, I have a friend pursuing his JSD at Cornell, And he told me that legal academia is undergoing some changes, including individuals getting a PhD in a subject like sociology or history, along with their JD, or pursuing a JSD. (laughs) Jesus Christ. You want to talk about a terrible plan? Going to law school with the intention of being a law professor is a terrible, terrible plan. Awful. (laughs) Just, it's unbelievably competitive. You have no idea how smart these people are. You have no idea how connected they are. You have no idea how many people go to law school trying to be a lawyer and then decide at the last minute, oh my God, I don't want to do that. Let me see if I can get the uh, life of a professor instead. Yeah, and they've been working their butt off, so now they have a very high GPA, which is what all, it's all that matters. What school did you go to and what was your GPA? That is what yeah. we're going to consider when we hire you. Granted, they are going to look to outside experience, but... Not really. Most of those people, from what I understand, haven't been working very long. So they might go into big law, but then they're going to turn around and come right back in uh, to academia, which is why there's sometimes a disconnect between professionals and academics, because the academics don't really have a lot of real world experience. They oh, can, but this Campos don't. book just reams the low quality of actual instruction in law school by talking about how these these you know legal academics basically what they did was they went to a great undergraduate school got really good grades went to a top law school got really good grades clerked for a year maybe worked in a firm for 2 years and then immediately became a law professor for the rest of their life yeah and campus is just reaming these people for having absolutely no idea what it's like to be a practicing lawyer like just because they didn't get enough experience in the real world to actually know what legal practice is like yeah exactly i mean the only reason I have some experience with this is that when I was working uh, as a legal writing consultant, you encounter this all the time, where you have attorneys who've been practicing for years, decades, and they're saying, hey, look, this is how things need to get done. And then you have legal academics who talk about legal writing, and their advice is so far from the tree <laughs> that you can just dismiss them. But they have their theories and their they've gotten inside their own heads, right? They're like, well, this would make the most logical sense. Therefore, this is what I'm going to teach my students in law school. And it is so far from the truth that it's pathetic. But they have their egos and their reputations to stand behind that they even write books about this, right? Yeah, this law review, things- all the law, law, law review articles everywhere, legal textbooks. <laughs> they have to do their professional academic writing, you know, that's what they're really there for, not teaching, it's to write. Mm -hmm. And so then, yeah, all these poor kids are just not really learning anything that's useful for the real world. Yeah. Anyways, sorry to go off on that, but Eh. I don't know. Uh, Good luck with that. (laughs) No, this is making me sad. Like, what, you just don't, this is the wrong path for anybody. This is just not a good path. I have already been berated about the dismal hiring statistics on the top law schools forum. So, besides it being the path least traveled for those who go to law school, do you have any information to share? (laughs) We're just piling on. Yeah, the information is run the hell away. The the berating is continuing. Um, I'm going to be starting my master... Wait, M. Phil. Is that a master's in philosophy? M. Phil. I never heard of that before. I'm going to be starting my MPhil in sociology at the University of Cambridge this upcoming fall, and will be making the decision soon to apply to PhD and or JD programs in the next year or so. I'd love to know your thoughts and think it may be interesting to other listeners. Okay. 
Decide on whether you want to get a PhD or JD based on what really truly interests you. Do you would you like studying whatever you'd have to study in either of those programs and then go do that? Because and, if you're going to be an academic in something, you've got to love it to the point where you're better than anyone else who loves it as well. Yeah, it's almost like you would just do it for free. Like you're not even thinking about the job. You just you're so passionate about this area. Mm-hmm. Of sociology or philosophy or law or whatever, you're so crazy about it that you just you think about it 24 hours a day anyway. Mm-hmm. That's all you're gonna do. And yeah. So you're gonna go study your ass off for four or five or ten years or whatever on this thing, and then maybe it turns into a job. Yep. Probably not, <laughs> but maybe. But maybe. And if it doesn't, yeah. it's okay. You you loved it anyways. Follow what you're passionate about. I mean, generally, we only say get a JD if you want to practice law. So, but if you're if you're so sure that you want to be an academic, and specifically you want to be a legal academic, God, I don't know. <laughs> oh, I don't by the know. way, what's your GPA right now? Is if it it's a not above a three nine? I don't know that you should be even thinking about this. Right. Right. Uh. Okay, lastly, I want you to know your podcast has completely converted me to the not paying for law school doctrine. So regardless of my path, a high LSAT score and full ride is the goal. Thanks for all you do. That's anonymous. Dedicated listener. Thanks, dedicated listener. Hmm. Um, good, definitely don't pay for law school. Um, boy, try to not pay for any of these other degrees either. I guess the good thing about PhDs is that they normally put you to work. Hmm. Right? I think yeah. they normally have you teach and stuff, so you don't I think it's not like typical to pay for a PhD in history or whatever. You're yeah. usually working for the school for four years teaching classes or whatever while you get your PhD. JD, sadly, is not like that. So you just have to get the high LSAT, high GPA, and then get your get your JD for free. Yeah. Good luck, man. Update us three years from now and let us know how that's working out. Um, trying to make it as a legal academic. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. We're going to infiltrate, Ben. We're going to even infiltrate the law schools themselves <laughs> All right, with our listeners. Yeah, that would be a, that would be a score. Get an actual professor who's successful and believes in the "don't pay for law school" mantra. Yes. Let's see if we can crank through a couple more of these. Sure. I'm scheduled to take the June LSAT this summer, and I'm feeling confident about doing well. However, I know it's important to have a backup plan and always be ready to take the test again in September. Mm. Forgetting about July. Yeah, July. So my question concerns what I should be doing in the five weeks following the June LSAT before I know my score. It's usually like three weeks, but okay. Uh Should I continue to study at the same level no matter what, just in case I don't do so well? Should I keep up with my skills and take a few more diagnostics but not overdo it? I would like to be optimistic that I will do well the first time around, but fear losing five weeks worth of prep time if I have to take it again. What kind of plan would you suggest? I would suggest to continue studying, but not as intensely. Take a week off or something or do whatever. You But you can keep going. Just Well, you shouldn't actually, sorry, let me just pause for a second here. You shouldn't be studying so intensely that you feel overwhelmed anyway, right? Right. So in theory, you should just be keep going. But it is natural for people to, I think, make sacrifices or things like that leading up to the exam. And so if you have done that, then definitely take it easier after the exam is over. But um, keep going. Why not? The plan is to take it again in July unless you do well. In June, not the plan is not to take it unless you don't do well. Yeah, you should commit yourself to studying more or less continuously between now and September and maybe even November. I mean, until you see your official score on record that makes you stop. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, like we're all we're talking about is an hour a day. So do your hour a day. It's good for your, it's like good personal development anyway, honestly. It makes you smarter. LSAT studying is good for your brain, for sure. It'll help you with uh, law school. 
Yeah, it will. So you're gonna you'll be increasing your vocabulary. You'll be getting better at you know even with the games. It's like hey, you're practicing this weird system thing where you have to solve a system. It's good for you. It's just good for you. So mm-hmm. it's going to make you better at everything you do. So and especially it's going to make you better at reading and writing. So yeah. just keep cranking away. Just do an hour a day until you're done. Yeah. Um, I got an email this week from one of my crazy lawyer friends. Who is a? She was a long time like friend of mine, former student, and she she reaches out to me every once in a while, Ben, because she wants the most recent LSATs, hmm. because she wants to do them for fun. Hmm. She's a big time like law firm lawyer. Yeah, that's <laughs> so. Peyton, those are the folks that you're going to be, you know, competing with in the legal world someday. So, um, yeah, you can go ahead and keep working on the LSAT. <laughs> it's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Nice one. Yeah. So here's an email from a student and I tried to email them back, but the, their, their email failed for whatever reason. Ah, let's, I don't know. Let's see what it says. Love the podcast. I've picked up lots of useful tips from you and Ben on how to slay the LSAT along with your everyday common sense advice on not getting oneself into a financial hole, e.g. by not paying for law school. Very much appreciated. That shouldn't be e.g. For example... Mm-mm. I.E. I.E. That is. Yeah. By not that being, is. I mean, I guess yeah. it could be an example, but please just don't ever use EG or IG. <laughs> Stop. We've said that before on the show. So you're yeah, don't not use EG. Close enough. Don't use IE, and especially don't use it incorrectly like this was. Yeah. Um, some background info on me. I graduated 15 years ago with a bachelor's degree in finance with a GPA of 2.99. Long sad story, family responsibilities, sick parent, etc., and have had a pretty decent business career along the way. Then five years ago, I graduated with a master's degree with a 4.0 GPA. I needed the degree to get promoted into a high-profile position within my organization. But I have not been very satisfied with my career goals, as I have always wanted to become a lawyer. I am very passionate about the profession and can spend days reading case laws Etc. A couple etc. here. I'm pretty sure you don't like those etc. either. Oh, do you? I hate them. Yeah. I hate no eg, no ig. One of them. No etc. Okay. Decision to go to law school and LSAT scores. In 2018, at the age of 40, I have finally decided to pursue a law degree. I feel I am well prepared mentally and physically and financially, if needed. I know that is a curse word for you to pay for law school. Of course, even though I can afford to pay for law school out of my pocket, I will never pay a dime. My diagnostic timed prep tests are somewhere between 157 and 160 on a given day. My plan is, of course, to raise it to get to at minimum 165 or more to have any chance for scholarship money. Well, you know, with your 160, that's a full ride to Concordia despite your low GPA. Yeah. That would be a, and a full ride to Thomas Jefferson. So, hey, you know, yeah, get the best score you can, get into a better school, but stick to your full ride. That's a good plan. Question. My question to you is whether you think law schools in general will overlook my application given my age and poor performance in my 15 year old undergrad transcript. I don't think they're going to discriminate against you on age, especially if you have a plan. And you're more likely to have a plan than younger applicants, but if you don't have a plan, they might scratch their heads and say, what the hell are you doing here? But that's true yeah. for anyone. Or I have a decent chance of getting into law school with a chance of full scholarship given my academic achievement in graduate school, 4.0 GPA, nobody cares about that, and hypothetical LSAT score of 165. They really, really do care about that. Mm-hmm. I really do not care about law school rankings. I know at the end of the day, it'll be my own determination and hard work that will propel me to succeed. I agree. Um, hey, you've been out of school for 15 years. You get a 165. You write an addendum just to point out, make sure that they see that you're 15 years removed from that 2.99. You can absolutely use your achievement in graduate school as supporting data that you're a better student now. Mm-hmm. They're going to take that with a pretty big grain of salt because it's grad school. Still better than a 3.4 or whatever the other person did. So, yeah. And, and, uh, with the 165, then they're going to think, oh, yeah, okay. You know, he's, 
she's got it. He or she mm-hmm. has got mm-hmm. it. Um, thanks in advice for your thanks in advance for your wisdom. I wish you continued success in all your endeavors, body. Thanks, body. I mean, yeah, I I think that LSAT score could definitely do it. And they, I mean, Thomas Jefferson and Concordia with a 160, according to them, they're literally not going to care about your undergraduate GPA at all. Mm-hmm. They're just going to give you a full ride period because you got a 160. Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's other schools out there who are going to get, you know, other better schools who are also going to give you a full ride for a 165. Yeah. That's going to be an actually like a different class of schools. Um, better schools, mm-hmm. but you'll be able to get a full ride. So as long as you, I mean, man, if you get that 165 and you apply broadly and you just decide you're not going to pay for law school, that's going to work out really well. So awesome. Great. Cool. Next. Maybe we should wrap it up there. The, okay. If that works for you. Works for me. Alrighty. That was episode 141. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.